ضيوفنا الكرام رحبوا معنا بماماندر فير الرئيس التنفيذي لمؤسسة توني إليميلو من المملكة المتحدة ومتحدثي هذه الجلسة Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Parminder Veer OBE, CEO of Tony Elamilu Foundation, UK, and her panel. Thank you. Good morning. And it's a pleasure to be in Saudi Arabia. This is my third attempt to come to your amazing country, and I'm glad that I've made it. So thank you very much. And on behalf of the Tony Elamilu Foundation, um, we thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to share the extraordinary story of a private sector leader investing in the future generation of private sector leaders, the SMEs and the entrepreneurs across the African continent. My task is an amazing task. I have the most extraordinary panel, a panel of social entrepreneurs. We know the world over that entrepreneurs and SMEs are the lifeblood of every nation on the continent. Um, whether you're a for-profit entrepreneur, and it's really important for entrepreneurs out there to know it is okay to make money. It's important to make money. It's only when you're generating revenues, you're able to create jobs, you're able to address all the social issues that are prevalent across the universe. But social entrepreneurs, I think, occupy a particular position. Um, they are extraordinary because they have identified within their own local communities amazing challenges, amazing um, problems, as it were, very big problems. And what they are bringing to the world are big solutions, solutions that are sustainable, that are really going to impact their local communities, and it's important for social entrepreneurs to be grounded in their local community, because the local is the global. If you can make your social enterprise or your for-profit enterprise work in the local community, you know you have an audience for it across, across the world, yeah? Um, but the, the common things that they share is that they have to be sustainable and they have to be scalable. So yes, you can bring a solution you think is only relevant to your own community, wherever you are, and we in the, in the foundation support social entrepreneurs and for-profit entrepreneurs. Over the last four years, we've invested in 4,470 entrepreneurs, and we have six more years to go of our $100 million commitment to supporting entrepreneurs across the continent. I want to invite each one of our social entrepreneurs on the stage to really share their stories. I'm a filmmaker, and there's nothing more universal than a story. Uh, once upon a time, the beginning, middle, and end of a story. And I'd like each one of my panelists to take the storytelling approach and, um, and, and, and imagine you as the audience um, in, in that they are compelling you to really take an interest and possibly invest in their extraordinary social enterprises. So I'll start with, with, with you, Ian. So should we start with you? Hi. Salam alaikum. Um, my name is Mark Arthur. I founded a community called WeShare. It's an international community, and I'm also a social entrepreneur. Um, back on the, on the last day, and regarding the, the, the theme of, of this, uh, this event, the skill of tomorrow, my personal opinion and what I wanted to share with you today is that empathy and the ability of people to listen and to, to understand what uh, other people suffer is probably one of the most important skills for tomorrow because when you understand and when you listen problems, then you have the ability to find a solution. And when you look at the future too much with the prism of technology, because we are used a, a bit too much to look at the future with the technology uh, view, with the technology vision, we, we look at the, at the city as a very, something very technique, something very technologic. Sometimes we forget that it's people that make the future, that it's people that build the solution of tomorrow. Communities already exist. Sometimes they, don't, they just have to, to be accelerated 
with money, but also with political support, entrepreneur support. And my job in France, I'm coming from Marseille right now, I just started a, a, a project called Panorama Mars. And the idea of Panorama Mars is to make, um, let's say, a laboratory in Marseille to be the next city of tomorrow, the next most uh, modern city, but allowing people to build things together with the politics, with the entrepreneur, and with the big companies. So what was the inspiration, why Marseille, and what was the inspiration and motivation behind setting up your social enterprise? Oh, first of all, Marseille is the oldest city in France. That's yes, indeed. <laughs> and Beautiful city. Marseille is a, cr is, it's a crossroad uh, of cultures. As you know, probably many people coming from North of Africa are living in Marseille, but also from everywhere in the country. So I think it's very interesting to see those people uh, working and building things together. The problem today is that many communities, I'm talking about professional communities, but also um, religious communities don't talk to each other. So all of them are working on solving, so, um, solving yeah. problems, are working on solutions such as education, poverty, or business, how to make people be an entrepreneur, etc. But they all find solutions, but they are not working together to build something bigger. That is, that, your, that is the, the power yeah. of we yeah. share, and also that is um, the power of make people uh, work together and back to the term of decision, yes. look no further, the solutions are, are already here. Just make people work together and to build the, the next one. The, so, so the solutions are already in front of you. You don't need to go elsewhere to look for those solutions. Exactly. You just have to have the ability to tap and integrate is what you're saying and break down those separated barriers and actually, I mean, leverage the power of the collective thinking. Yeah, of course, uh, I, would, I would like something is, in France, we designed the democracy that in a way that we vote every five years, but once we have voted, you don't do anything else. And I think it's, it's stupid, because yeah. a lot of citizens have something to say all during this, mm. this time and this period, and democracy is to make people work together all day long, all, the, all, all year long. And this is a new way we want to, to, to build democracy, to make people work for the city, where, for the place where they, where they live. Now, I notice he's also an extraordinarily passionate about um, climbing mountains and navigation. I've just come from the Himalayas trekking for 10 days, so I invite you to come to the Himalayas and, and go on a trek, because there's nothing like walking in the mountains for meditation and for reflection. But I came by plane. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can we meet, move to, um, yeah, how do I pronounce your name, Lian? Ilan. Ilan. Ilan, thank you. Ilan is a very young filmmaker living in my city, London, which is where I worked, in fact, for 30 years as a film producer and a film financier. So I'm delighted to meet Ilan, who is also using the power of storytelling to do precisely what you are doing, which is how do we tell stories um, where we find the universality and where then people from across cultures can actually begin to connect with. So Ilan, share with us your amazing filmmaking experience in London. Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah so I'm Ilan, I'm a filmmaker. I make films from travel films to documentaries uh, to short form uh, music videos and things like that. But yeah, my main message today really is similar to what you said, is about storytelling. Um, I think now with the de development of technology, more and more, you know, we're looking at VR, virtual reality, um, and technology is getting better and better, but we're getting away from the storytelling, which is, you know, something we really connect with, and that's something that, again, as Mark said, creates empathy. Um, I'm actually here, uh, as well as being at, at MISC, I'm here with World Merit, and we're shooting um, a short documentary on Serious. three um, women that are here. Uh, and their stories in their separate countries and how they're coming together here in, in Saudi Arabia for global change. So I think it's really important telling personal stories um, of, you know, of people doing the best they can in, in their own communities and coming together here um, in this amazing place in Riyadh, showing off the beauty of this place and how this can be kind of the, the benchmark for change in, in the whole world. Yeah. Thank you. Now we come to Leroy. Leroy is, I mean, amazing. Only because, not just because, 
Leroy was one of the youngest entrepreneurs. Our program is open to entrepreneurs from the age of 18 to 100 plus. By the way, guys, oldrepreneurs, that's my generation, are the fastest growing entrepreneurs on, across the world, okay? So please do not underestimate the power of being old. Huh? But Leroy was one of the youngest. He was 18 years old when he applied in 2016 to the Tony Lumilu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program. And I think from 45,000 in our second year, he was selected. And lo and behold, this year I pick up my Forbes magazine and find that he is now one of, um, listed as one of the under 30 entrepreneurs, and I think he wasn't even 22. I think they bent the rules to put him in that list, yeah? So Leroy is from Kenya. Um, Leroy, share with us your social enterprise and why it matters and what's the big, big problems that it, it is addressing. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is Leroy. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, <clears throat> I'm very, I'm very fortunate to lead a, a social enterprise I call uh, Green Pact. And uh, I'd say what's really fun about the work we do is that we uh, deal with the bottom of the pyramid. So what, what we do at Green Pact is use biogas technology to be able to uh, empower local communities and in, remove them from socioeconomic uh, gridlocks. So we do this by installing biogas digesters to, the, to their homes. So we do this to farmers, we do this to companies, we do this to uh, children's homes as well. And uh, it's been uh, four, four, four good years. And I'd say uh, it's been a really, really, really humbling journey for me. Yeah. I mean, four amazing years. You've been on CNN three times, the Huffington Post, Forbes, Fast Company, and the list goes on. How have you managed um, success that you've achieved so quickly? Uh, I'd, I'd mainly attribute a success to mainly being tied to our most important uh, stakeholder, that's our users. So a, a very big fraction of our users are mostly local communities. Uh, these are ordinary people who who survive on less than uh, $5 a day. And uh, you know what's, where the motivation of this all came from was when Green Park started, uh, that was when I was 18, I was still in high school. Uh, there was a problem in my, in my school where I was, I was to study in Kenya, and there was a sewer problem. So I took it upon myself and made the responsibility to try and, try and come up with a solution to it. But then when I graduated high school, I realized that, you know, this is not a problem that's facing my, my community. It's a problem facing nine million Kenyan households with each having a, an average headcount of five. So this is where we set out. And um, I'd say right now at the age of 21, it's, uh, it's been a, a very, a very uh, eye-opening journey. And still there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that we have to do, especially in the social enterprise sector and in the renewable energy sector. Thank you. We now turn to Ryan from Indonesia. The amazing thing about Miss Global Forum is that they've literally gathered the entire world in Saudi Arabia. So congratulations to the organizers. Because, we <laughs> because as much as someone who was born in the analog age loves the social media, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc., there's nothing like meeting someone face to face and engaging with them, you know, eyeball to eyeball, and feeling that emotional energy and connection. So it's just fantastic that Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, US are all represented, and the Middle East, of course, are all represented here. Ryan, you think that design can be a tool for solving social issues. Yes. Tell us about social, is it design? Design. Yeah. design. Yeah, we call it social design. -y. Social design. Social design, -y, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, social design -y is actually a social community that uh, we create. So, I'm basically uh, creating several social movements. One of them is social design -y, uh, uh, that we teach uh, children in rural areas in Indonesia uh, every Saturday about creativity. 
So we try to improve the creativity of the young people in Indonesia. Uh, right now, we already uh, developed around 18 villages together with 1,200 youths uh, from Indonesia. That's what we do right now. Amazing. Thank you. OK, so you've all heard what's been their motivation and inspiration that aspires for young men, but I'm sure there are lots and lots of women in the social enterprise space um, to give up their day jobs and actually say, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I believe that you can't be a social entrepreneur or an entrepreneur as a part-time job. It's a full-time commitment to, <laughs> to doing that. Inevitably, there are challenges, yeah? We all believe I've been an entrepreneur all my life, and I've often thought I'm the only one at 3 o'clock in the morning going through this problem. And that's one of the reasons why in the foundation we ensure that when the entrepreneurs graduate, that they become part of an alumni network. So now we have 4,470 across the 54 African countries. So if I'm an entrepreneur in South Africa, I know I can talk to an entrepreneur in Algeria or in Egypt or in Kenya um, because they will be going through similar challenges. So what I'd like the panel to do is to share some of your extraordinary challenges and possibly some of the solutions that you've brought for yourself to ensuring that your social enterprise remains sustainable, yeah. <laughs> remains alive actually, and then sustainable. Yeah. Well, um, it's not easy every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you say at the beginning, when you are a social entrepreneur, you are trying to solve social issues and also, you are doing a business. So if there is no business, there is no possibility to solve the problem you want to address. So let's start with the business. But it's not always easy, because you have to change the mindset of all the stakeholders you are talking with. Why that? Because when you can make, let's say, 10% margin, you want to say, we are not going to make 10%, but 2%, because the 8% will be invested in problem resolution. So you have to convince people, and this mindset is a, a bit new, I think, in mm -hmm. over the world. Yeah. Make people understand that you don't do everything just for money, but because you want to address problems, it's not easy. So when I go to find partners and I say, uh, let's, let's invest 100K in, in this project, for example, an education project in, Mar in Marseille, let's build a new school or a new place where we, were, we will allow people to meet and to create a new community, and thanks to these links, things are going to happen. They say, yeah, but what is the return on investment? And you have to yeah. say, okay, I, I can't give you the return on investment right now, but make sure that it, it will happen. But it's it, not an Excel. No, I know. So returns on investment. Um, a filmmaker from the UK, yeah, so how, how, you know, as a filmmaker, I know, you know, that you're taking people's money, um, or rather the investor's money, and that they do want to see return. So what I used to say is that, you know, my film, it will be critical acclaim, it, yeah? Which means you'll get a lot of publicity and a lot of mileage, and the story will really go very far. Or that there will be returns on investment in terms of, actually, you will make money. And some of our films, like Avatar, made lots of money. Life of Pi made lots of money. Other films made lots, you know, won a lot of awards, yeah? How, how do you ensure, what are your challenges in telling these um, extraordinary stories um, in, in, and, and getting it to the audience? I think, for me, I mean, everyone in this room, everyone in this room, sorry, has a, has a phone. I mean, everyone's looking at exactly. content constantly, right? So. The biggest challenge for me as a filmmaker is how to stand out, how to make my work look unique, because there's so much work out there, there's so much um, content people are constantly sharing. So the main challenge for me is how do I um, make my video stand out, how do, does someone watch it, and then actually want to implement change after watching a film. Um, so that is kind of the obstacle I face with, with every project. And the way I kind of get around that is by trying to collaborate with as much different creative people as possible. For me, I, I shoot a lot of travel films. Um, I've shot films in, in India, in South Africa, in Thailand. Um, and in all those places, apart from seeing you know, the beauty and the culture of the, these places, it's finding creatives 
in, in the places I go to um, and collaborating with them and, and you know, sharing my knowledge and sharing their knowledge to create the best possible uh, piece of work. For example, I went to uh, South Africa in 2016 um, and you know, through the power of Instagram and social media, I managed to get in touch with some creatives there and because of it, they showed me you know, the, the best places around in South Africa and we could create the best film possible that had the biggest impact on the audience. So I, I really think it's about finding the right people who align with your vision um, and using their knowledge and your knowledge together to create the most you know, visually appealing uh, piece of work that really has an impact. Thank you so much. Leroy, apart from managing success, what has been some of your challenges? Uh, I'd say uh, for, for the work that I do, it has been setting really concrete KPIs and that uh, if we're doing, if we're doing um, activity X and Y, what, what, what's put in place to make sure that we're very successful? Uh, our, work main, our work entails us reiterating our model because uh, definitely the work that we do involves a lot of a lot of physics, so we'll go back to the same physics and you know see how we can make our systems more efficient because we are in the business of efficiency. And uh, here we're dealing with uh, you know in, investors' money, and we're also dealing with stakeholders who want to see value for what they're putting in. And uh, also another thing I'd say is how how we can you know scale and make sure that we get to get to be accessible by literally every, every Kenyan, which is why I'd say on this day also inviting investors as well to you know, buy into our vision and uh, make us make this renewable energy accessible to not just Kenyans, but to also you know, the rest of Africa. But it's also the stakeholders to take a risk, isn't it? Yeah? Whether you're a banker, private equity, angel, investor, whatever you are, is actually try and come out of your shoes and step into the shoes of the social entrepreneur. Um, can we go to social design? Ryan, what have been some of your challenges? Maybe in the, also in the context of Indonesia, because we know social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs can only thrive if the, the enabling environment is yep. there. And the, that enabling environment requires both the government and the private sector to work together to really facilitate and support the emergence and the growth of entrepreneurs. Okay, uh, talking about challenges, maybe I will start uh, by highlighting uh, yesterday's session <laughs> about that young people actually uh, know that uh, some social issue around them, but uh, less taking action. Uh, so that's the same because uh, actually we are young people maybe lacking of resources. Like uh, maybe some of them, uh, some of young people don't have decent income, don't have his uh, networking. That also applies to me. Uh, when I'm actually never thought that I will be one of the social activists before. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's the, the challenge um, itself because actually uh, four years ago I never uh, see myself like this. Wow. Four years ago, I was actually just an introvert. I cannot socialize with any people. Uh, it happens since, since I'm uh, very young, because my parents is like uh, like uh, holding me. Uh, I'm, I'm cannot go freely into socializing with people. That's what happened, and that become makes me become very introverted. And uh, whenever I'm doing the social, uh, sorry, the school teamwork, um, usually I don't get a team at all <laughs> because I have trouble socializing. That's a, the problem. Yeah. So uh, what changed uh, that, that, that thing? Uh, the thing comes uh, when I go to high school, I live alone without my parents because my parents went to another city. Yeah, Indonesia is a very big, very big country. We have a lot of cities in there. And since that, I live alone. And short story, my father, uh, my father and my mother uh, fight each, uh, every, every, every night and uh, they separate. That's what happened. And yeah. Every night I got call from my. This is uh, like uh, the story why I become a social move, really? uh, social activist. Yeah. Really? Uh, Thank. And then uh, every night my my father called to me. Your mother is like this, like this, like this. Hatred, hatred. And then after I closed the call, my mother called me and said, <laughs> My father, this, 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 this. Hatred again. And every night I go back into my room alone. No, pe no person here. And I uh, don't don't know where I can share this hatred into somebody. 
that got me really depressed, and I tried to some, sometimes to end my life. Luckily, uh, I, uh, it, didn't, it, it didn't happen. Uh, I, uh, I still live until now. And one moment that changed my life is when uh, I go into an open, open, open house, and I'm doing some, uh, one social activity there. I'm teaching uh, children about how to create a craft. And before uh, they doing the craft, they have to write their dream uh, in the paper. In the paper, yeah. In the paper. And one orphan children actually uh, changed my life. Wow. He write that uh, these orphan children say that I want to be someone, use, some, someone useful so other people don't feel the pain that I, fe that I feel. Thank you so much. What an amazing story. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. You know, at most conferences, people talk, 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 and then nothing. We exchange emails. We now have this technology thing that we can tap each other, and we take away lots of business cards, etc. What I want my panel to do is really you have the opportunity to give this extraordinary audience, and Leroy and I were discussing this last night, is really a call to action. You have this audience, right? Some of them are very influential and very powerful. Others are looking to be inspired by your own ent social entrepreneurial journeys. What is your call to action from your own social enterprise point of view to the audience and to yourself as well? Uh, come to Marseille. We have four minutes in which to do this, by the way. Come to Marseille <laughs> and join uh, our community. That, uh, we are. We are uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, I mean, it, yeah, just please to, go to Marseille. To be very quick, we are just trying to build a new, a new building, which, which will be, which will be a, a kind of new school, uh, allowing people to meet, to be entrepreneurs, and to make Marseille, as I said before, a laboratory for the Mediterranean area. So, uh, really, a, a crossroad and a place to meet and to make people build the future through a social innovation. And if you have any plan or any idea uh, you want to share with me, so let's meet after the, the session, after Fantastic. the panel. Fantastic. Ian. Um, for me, I'm, I'm always looking to collaborate with as many people as possible. I mean, I love working on a lot of different projects, as, you know, and I love being able to be creative as possible. So, um, you know, right now I'm working with World Merit, and the great thing about World Merit is they're open to creativity, they're open to... Um, you know, telling creative stories. So, yeah, I mean, in the future, I'd love to work with more. And, um, yeah, I'm active on social media. There's a lot of my work is on Instagram, which is just my name, Ilan, I-L-A-N, and then my surname. But, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, I do, you should all share your, at least one social media handle, your <laughs> website, whatever, as well. Yeah? Sure. Plug. Leroy, what's your call to action? For uh, me, the... My view is that change does not start with an institution. Change does not start with, uh, with the government. Change starts with, with, with you, with an individual. And uh, definitely there are very many ways in which you know, uh, we can be able to pump in into, into a vision. And with such a very uh, profound platform, I'd say it starts with uh, you. What, 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 what can you pump into the vision? And, Pumping into the vision does not necessarily mean uh, financial, uh, financial, financial uh, money per se, exactly. but it involves very, very many other ways, contributing time to it, contributing uh, insights and other resources into it. So I'd say uh, change starts with, with you and uh, our, my contact, uh, or, uh, or rather our contact is uh, Green Pact on social media, I'm at Leroy Mosaru on social media as well, and I'm very happy to connect after the panel. Ryan, what's your call to action to the audience and to the MISC Foundation and to the MISC Global Forum? Yeah, I think for young people, uh, we just have to start uh, doing some, uh, something right now. No matter uh, how inexperienced we are, what our problem that we have, but we have something, uh, the power to make a change. No, no, no problem about what we're lacking, but try what we have and go, do it, make it something. Like we can do a f a filming, we do filming for social goods, we can do uh, mathematics, we can do mathematics for social good. So it's not like we are only doing these uh, things for only our school or only our office, but it's for society. Yeah, 
And we are, how we break the boundaries? Using our creativity, we can break our boundaries. And together, of course, with a foundation help, uh, also with government supports, we can grow the impact even bigger and impacting more youth and the society. Wow. So with that, I give you four extraordinary social entrepreneurs. And I hope they have their own journeys and their stories have inspired many of you in the audience to take up this thing called, we have the power to make a change. We have the power. And the other is obviously the quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which is, be the change you want to see. Um, we thank Miss Global Forum. I'd like to thank my panel and the forum for giving us this extraordinary platform to share these amazing stories. And we're on time. Thank you. Shukran. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys.